Good night. Good afternoon. Good morning to some of you. As usual, it's a pleasure uh, once again to be with you on another live. And we have a very interesting topic tonight. So we're just going to wait for some folks to climb up in here. And uh, as you would have seen, this is a part one. Very interesting topic. And it has a lot to do with many of you that are fasting right now because I've been getting this constant, constant, constant question about specific dreams. And I had decided to do this video. And I did this video. I did a, a video on our spiritual robbers eons ago. In fact, it was the second or first video that I've ever done on, on YouTube. So that's like almost, that's like 10 years ago. All right. So this here is, a, of course, an updated version and one that is really, 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 really needed. So we had almost 200. So I'm going to wait till we get to 500. And once we get to 500, uh, then we're going to run off. But while we're waiting on that, let me just make sure I'm on here. While we're waiting on that, here we go. While we're waiting on that, I want to share this dream that I had years ago. And I, I, I would have repeated this dream before. But the only reason why I'm, I'm rehashing it again is because it has everything to do with what we are about to talk about tonight. And this would have been, again, several years ago. I was on a, I think it was a, a dry fast, I believe. Could have been a seven day, but I believe it was a dry fast. I, yeah, I think it was a dry fast. And uh, it was the last day of the fast. It was going to end at 12 that night. So about two hours before the fast ended, I was right in the back here, across your sorry, just lying on my couch. Uh, my wife was in the room. And sorry, no, this, this is a different dream. <laughs> no, I was I was on the couch and I was on the other couch. And my, my television was on in this case, but I had it on a very low volume. And my wife was in the room. And all of a sudden, I began to doze off. But when I dozed off, I felt like I was in another realm, like another another place. I, I was in my home, but I mean, I, I was like, I know I was in this, this house, but it was very much spiritual. So when I looked towards the room area and the aisleway, because I could see it from where I was sitting, I saw this image of a man. So by the time I got up, and really begin to do my eyes as if this was real, it was now not directly in front of me, but it was in front of me, but on my right-hand side. And he's standing like about six feet tall, could be a little taller, and he was wearing a black pair of trousers, black pants, with a, a black and white stripe shirt, right? And his arms are folded, and he's wearing like this black hat, like a robot. He's dressed exactly like how a robot would look on the television, right? And he's staring at me, and I'm looking at him, and this is all real. But the, the, the reality of this was all spiritual. But I was fully conscious, and I'm looking at this, this being. And he's staring at me. And he just disappeared. So I actually end up falling asleep out here. So that morning, when my wife came out, I said, let me go in the room and really get some rest. Rest in that, because I sat up right in the couch, you know, I felt kind of painful. So I went into the room. So when I went into the room, I lay in the bed. I heard when the door opened, and I was between sleep and wake, and I felt this presence come in the bed. So I'm thinking, this is my wife. But it wasn't her. In fact, it was nobody. <laughs> there was nobody in there. And I, to be honest with you, I was too tired to even rebuke anything. But I did say it in my spirit. I rebuke it. Now, I'm telling you that because where we're going tonight, as usual, I'm going to give you the spiritual, sorry, the biblical backing for the reality of these things. And those of you who uh, watch me on a regular basis, and, you know, I specifically deal with spiritual things. That's my ministry, whether it's witchcraft, voodoo, whatever. We deal from the biblical spiritual part of it, looking at the blessings and the curses so that we'll have a balanced gospel. And to be fully informed 
as to when we now launch our attacks, we're not just throwing stuff out there haphazardly hoping to hit something, but because of the education and spiritual knowledge and intelligence that we have acquired, we now have strategies going behind specific entities like we're about to do tonight, all right? So God showed me in that dream, and I've had many dreams like that. God showed me in that dream where, see, Kevin, this right here, this is real, but this is spiritual. And the robbing that they're doing to you is worse than the physical robbing because the physical things that are being taken away from you or hijacked from you is as a result of what these guys are doing spiritually. All right? The other dream I had, again, this was a fast. I believe it was a seven-day one. Again, I'm, I'm ending this fast. So I'm in the couch. This time I'm lying down. I'm not, not really lying down, but kind of slouch in the couch. And the television was off. So I was out here. And there wasn't no light, but light was coming from the room because my wife was in there doing something. And all of a sudden, I'm looking again towards the aisle way where the rooms are. And this lady, almost like an Amazon lady, I don't know if you ever saw those movies of the muscular built Amazon lady, and she's wearing like this Roman type soldier attire where the, you know, like the metal breastplate and sleeveless. It's a sleeveless metal breastplate and it have like the scales type uh, design, but they're all metals. And she's wearing this skirt, short skirt, exactly like how the material is with the top. It's like the bottom, but they all metal. And I'm watching this lady coming from the aisleway, coming charging towards me just like this. And all I saw, she draw this silver sword just like this and coming directly at me. I could not see no feet. It was almost as if she was just running on the air. And when she pulled that sword, now that I'm, I'm looking at this and more amazed at, wow, this, this is actually real. But clearly she's a spiritual being. And when she draw that sword and come at me, I said, hey. And boof, she just vanished in the air. Now, I'm not hallucinating. I'm not going crazy because one of the first things that I do when I have these encounters is I look around in my surroundings. Is the TV on? Is the light on? I mean, I, I want to make sure. Let me touch this couch to make sure everything is, this is natural. But here it is, even though it's natural, I'm literally in the spiritual realm. And again, the Lord is showing me these invisible forces that you would never see under normal circumstances, always seeking, just like the scripture says, to, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And again, this is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight because I've had many of you, especially who's doing that fast now, a lot of you were encouraged by my fast and all of you on the fast right now, most of you actually, some of you have completed already, and a lot of you are just writing me about these strange occurrences and you want some clarity on it. And I felt the need to really teach on this tonight because I don't want you to think you're hallucinating, you're going crazy. And I know those who are uh, spiritually unlearned would tell you that. But I'm going to give you scriptures tonight to show you the reality. I say this to you all the time. We coexist with spiritual beings. And for you to say that's not true, and then you say you are a Christian and you believe in God and you believe in angels, then you're a liar because... How could you believe in those spiritual beings, but you don't believe in the negative side of it? And again, this is where the balanced gospel comes in. Because your gospel is not balanced, to you, you're trying to find a scientific reason behind these things, or medical reason, or some other nonsense, when the reality is, reality is staring you in your face. Okay, so we at 574 right now. And again, our topic, as you would see here, the mystery behind spiritual robbers. This is a powerful, powerful teaching. I would strongly suggest if you know someone who you think need to hear this, they, they really, really need to listen to what I'm going to say tonight. As usual, like I always say, my, my, I have my a cadre of scriptures here, and we're just going to build a foundation tonight. We're going to build this foundation, and then tomorrow night and the night after, we're going to now uh, build on that particular foundation. But we need a solid foundation in order to make it palatable going forward. So the idea here is to, yes, give you a foundation, but one with understanding. This is key. 
You cannot be a successful, victorious Christian if you're spiritually obese, you're just absorbing the word, but you don't understand it. And only those little uh, key points you get, God is going to give you double for your trouble. Enemies you see today. No, we won't go beyond that. All right. So the scripture that I want us to look at tonight and what I'm giving you tonight are all spiritual laws and rules like I normally do. And the purpose for it is that you, this is what brings the understanding. This man is not making up anything. This man is not pulling something out of a hat. This man is actually taking us through the Bible and showing us the rules. And once he would have shown us the rules, he's going to take us into the life of a particular person in the Bible where we're going to see all of these rules coming together, which is only evidence that he's not making it up. Because all he's doing is giving us the key points what these brothers are applying, and this is why they're getting this specific result over here. All right? So this is going to be very, very powerful tonight, all right? Spiritual robbers, the mystery behind spiritual robbers. Now, what is a spiritual robber? Now, I, I would have put the definition there. Okay, yeah, here it is. I have one here. <clears throat> spiritual robbers are spiritual beings specifically from the kingdom of darkness that rob from human beings. This, this stealing is initiated spiritually Focusing on the spiritual blessings, key word there, spiritual blessings, key phrase, sorry, set aside by God for that particular individual. Nevertheless, these spiritual robbers cannot achieve this by themselves or alone. It will require the cooperation knowingly or even unknowingly of their human victims. This is done by securing an agreement from their victim to rob them. In the spiritual world, this securing of an agreement is known as a covenant. So what does that basically mean in a nutshell? Well, what it means in a nutshell is right now where you are and where I'm at, there are spiritual beings where we are that we cannot see according to Scripture. This is not my opinion, all right? And the, the, from, from the kingdom of light perspective, we are told in Scripture, it says that the angels, or sorry, the angel of the Lord, uh, Psalms 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamp round about those that fear him and deliver them. So if you fear God, according to that scripture, there are angels or an angel at minimum here where you are. All right? Uh, in Romans chapter 7, verse 21, Paul said, I have discovered a law that whenever I attempt to do good, Evil, and evil isn't a word, evil is a, is a being, is a presence. Evil or demonic forces are with me. They have a right to be there. So every second of our lives, there are spiritual beings influencing us. Whether we are aware of it or not, whether we believe it or not, they're here. And their job is to coerce. Their job is to influence. Their job is to get you to put aside your human will and take on their suggestions, uh, what I call the power of suggestion. And that is what they do. So in this particular teaching, we are going to see that when, and we're dealing specifically as it relates to spiritual robbers, we're dealing with the kingdom of darkness, all right? But before I tell you about the kingdom of darkness and how they steal, and more specifically, what they are stealing to cause the losses in our physical lives, that's the part that you really, really, really want to zoom in on. Right now, let's look at, let's look at, let's look at what what we need to be focused on. All right. So, let's look at Second Corinthians chapter four and verse eighteen. Okay, we're looking at the rules now, right? We're looking at the commandments, the instructions, the rules. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. And this is the Apostle Paul, letter to the church of Corinth. And listen to what he's saying to them. He says in verse 18, he says, While we, who is this we you're talking about, Mr. Paul? The we here are the believers of Jesus Christ. He says, while we... Look not at the things which are seen. Okay, put a pin in there. 
What you're talking about, Paul? He says, as a believer of Jesus Christ, life for you should be totally spiritual, not in a fanatic way, but when you make your assessments, you're not making it from a cosmetic or superficial or aesthetic perspective, meaning it's not what you see. As a believer of Jesus Christ, who believe that you are living in a world not only saturated, but you're coexisting with invisible beings, then your thinking now must evolve around that. And that the things that are happening physically or materially or as it relates to the, the, the responding of your five senses, he say, he's about to say that there is a force behind that, which is where we get the spiritual beings influencing us now. So in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, he says, While we, the believers, look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That don't make sense. What do you mean? How can I look at something that is not there? Well, he's referring to the spiritual or the invisible world. Because if you say you believe in Jesus, he's a spirit. If you say you believe in God, he's a spirit. If you believe in Satan, he's a spirit. If you believe in angels and evil spirits and demonic forces, they are spiritual entities. So Paul is telling the church of Corinth, your focus must be on that world. And your assessments and judgments, <clears throat> if it's initiated from that world will be more precise when you're making those assessments from this world here. Because it is so, the, the reason why you're coming up with your conclusions or whatever is because you're now looking at the spiritual realm to see why this is happening. So he says here, set not your eyes on the things that are seen, but on the things which are not seen. Mm -hmm. And he's about to explain more. For the things which are seen are temporal. This mic, my physical body, that lamp you see in the back there, everything material that you could literally engulf with the, your view of your eyes, he says these things are temporal, meaning they're, they're temporary, they're all, in fact, in so much words he's saying, I wouldn't use the word not real, but it's just a design, it's just they're temporary, it's, it's, it's no real substance behind it. It's not going to be there forever then. He says, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So he says, whatever is going on in the unseen world or the spiritual world, these things are forever. Hence, we come to the conclusion, if the things in the unseen world are eternal and the things in this physical world is temporal, then it stands to reason. I mean, you don't even have to be a scholar on this, that the unseen world must be the world in which these things are produced, manufactured, created, conceived. In fact, it is the parent world to this physical world. Take my time here. I no rush tonight. All right? We will make sense out of this now. We're trying to make sense because when we take off in this jet right now, we would have already been belt in and had everything. And we could just shoot for it, right? Now, let's back up what he's saying. This is his letter now to the church of Corinth, right? Now, let's look at his letter that's going to support the, the letter in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go there quickly. Ephesians chapter 6, all right? And we're going to start from verse 12, all right? But when we read verse 12, we're going to go to verse 11, all right? But verse 12 of Ephesians 6 is in great support or correlate with 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, we are being given specific instructions. Do not become focused on this argument between you and your spouse. Do not become focused on the mechanic did something. He says, oh, you believers, because the people of the world wouldn't understand this. You believers, you must understand that there is an, there's a being or there's an invisible force behind this that's pulling the strings. So he backs this up in Ephesians 6 verse 12. He says, for we, using this term, we again, who is the we? Because he's speaking to a, a chosen group of people, a group of people chosen in the sense that they have decided to make the Lord Jesus Christ their Savior. 
an invisible being, one whom they have never seen. So he's saying now we must come to the understanding as believers of Jesus Christ that there is a world that coexists with our world. In fact, it's the parent world to this world. Whatever happens in this physical world will only be the result of it being I mean, formally conceived in the, the unseen world. All right? So he says in verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6, he says, For we, the believers, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He says, now you see, he's proving what I'm saying. Flesh and blood, according to 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, this is what will be considered temporal. This is just a distraction. This is the, hey, 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 come fight me. But this isn't the real poison you need to be fighting. It's the spirit behind this, this distraction that I ought to be focused on, which is unseen. So Paul is telling them, he's driving home this point in Ephesians 6 verse 12. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, but what? Meaning he's saying now what we should be wrestling against. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, but we wrestle against principalities. These are all spiritual hierarchies, but from the demonic kingdom. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual, circle the prefix spiritual, because it automatically indicates that whatever he's about to say after that means that it's, it's invisible. He says spiritual wickedness. This is not wickedness that I could see, but there's an invisible force that is wicked influencing what I do see. Boy, I'm trying to help somebody tonight. I'm trying to help you tonight. This, I tell you, you all better go get some. Before I go deeper, call somebody who need to hear this. They need to hear this because once I build this thing, I'm going to go into some dreams and I'm going to talk about some dreams that just about every last one of you have had, which is going to be the evidence that there are spiritual robbers in your life. And these spiritual robbers are exposed during the time of fasting. So Paul is saying here in Ephesians 6 and 12, he says, hey, now let's be focused now. Before you get into war, before you get into war now, you need to know who your real opponents are, who your real enemies, your mother, your mother-in-law, your sister, your brother, those who evil enemies against you, these are not your true enemies. These people are just puppets being used by the enemy unknowingly as a distraction to you while the enemy used them to pull you in on his turf. So he got out two of y'all as two puppets. But, he's, but Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, as well as Ephesians 6 and 12, he says, but we, who is this we? We the believers of Jesus Christ. We know, we know better that our true fight is not with human beings, is not with material things, right? Now let's go now up to verse 11, because he just told us what our fights, our fighters are. Who our fighters with. So verse 11 of Ephesians 6 says, he say, now put on the whole armor of God. So Paul now is saying, okay, listen to this. Yes, you have Jesus Christ. You are saved. You are blood washed. You are saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, all of those accolades. you got all of those titles, all of that, right? But the reality is all of that isn't going to protect you from the invisible forces that are on a consistent basis opposing you. Paul is saying, I just told you who the real fight, who, who you are really fighting, number one in Ephesians 6 and 12, right? Number two, I told you in, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18 that you must not be focused on the material or the physical things in life. Instead, be focused on the spiritual world. He says, now with that said, in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11, He's now commanding us. He says, listen, don't ever fool yourself by believing that because you've accepted Jesus Christ, because you've accepted Jesus Christ and you had the so-called Holy Ghost and flip on the floor a couple of times and do three and a half turn twist somersault. He says, no, don't ever let you believe or think that that's convincing others that you are protected. You are protected to a certain degree but Paul is saying, even though you got Jesus, even though the angels of the Lord encamp around about you, even though he's given his angels charge over you, Paul is now giving us another layer of security. 
But is this against human beings? No. Because verse 12 says, hey, I told you you ain't fighting flesh and blood. You are fighting invisible forces. So verse 11 of Ephesians 6 says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the tricks, the manipulation, the control. The He says, put on the armor so that you may be. Why didn't he say put on the armor? so that you will be successful against the devil. Because there are several components. Several, one of them is the armor, but do you have Jesus Christ? Are you covered in the blood of Jesus? There are so many, do you know the rules, the regulations? Do you understand, according to uh, Psalms 94 verse 20, are you aware that the enemy or the throne of iniquity establish their mischief by law? So when they come at you, they're not coming haphazardly. They're coming with, a, with the law. And the, the whole idea initially is to get you to break the law so that they will have a foothold in your life. So this is why the scripture says, so that you may be able, meaning that if you are not following the rules uncovered and you have Jesus Christ and all of these other things, then the devil have an opportunity in your life. I hope I'm making sense to you guys tonight. Okay. And take my time. I, I get excited, so I just got to take my time here, right? So, so far, I think I've made my case here in terms of who and what we ought to be fighting. And that's pretty clear, right? Now, I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 1. This is where it's going to become powerful, all right? This is going to become powerful because what we're about to read now, we're about to read where God has already outfitted all of us, particularly the believers, with everything necessary to succeed on the earth. Let me put it another way. If you're going to become wealthy one day, if you're going to obtain a degree, if you're going to get married, if you're going to have children, if you're going to do all of this in the line of God and what he had ordained, then what we're about to read, these things were already in place for you. But again, this is the key. But they're in place from a spiritual perspective. Now, this is key in this entire teaching tonight because this is what the spiritual robbers are coming for, what I'm about to teach you right now. So let's go to Ephesians. This is so powerful. I so love this here. Let's go here to Ephesians chapter 1. This is a very powerful scripture. And we're going to read from verse 3 to verse 4. Very, very common scripture. I, I use this all the time, and you need to hear this. Ephesians chapter 1. This, Remember, this topic is the mystery behind spiritual robbers. Spiritual robbers are spiritual beings that's coming to attack human beings, but not from a physical perspective. They're coming specifically at your spiritual blessings because your blessings are twofold. In its original state, in the spiritual realm, they are known as spiritual blessing, meaning you cannot see them. They're not tangible. You cannot go and pick them off a tree. No. However, God, who has made all things beautiful in his time, according to uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, 3 verse 11, and also Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, where he says that there's a, there's a time and a season for everything. If you're in the divine will of God, then each part and stage of your life, those blessings, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, are going to be released into your life. These blessings are the things that are supposed to make you prosper and enjoy life. Whether it's that season to be married, that season to go to college, the season with a season of welcome, the season of favor, all of these are what the Bible calls spiritual blessings. Okay? And I'm going to show you how we get these spiritual blessings, and I'm going to show you how the enemy get the right to take them from us, which the spiritual robbers are now going to come into play. All right? I hope I'm making sense here now. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, listen carefully what the writer is saying. He says, blessed, E-D, past tense, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had, what did he do? Who had blessed, E-D. E-D means this has happened already. This is past tense. It's saying, blessed be the Lord, 
sorry, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have already then, he has already blessed us. Okay. Now, what did he bless us with? He blessed us with not some, circle this word, circle the word all, then the word after that, circle, which is spiritual. It says, blessed be the Lord our God, Jesus Christ, who has already, this has already happened in the spiritual realm. This has already taken place before you were born. If I, if I want to push the envelope even further, he has already blessed us with all, listen carefully, this is key in this entire text, with all what? Spiritual. Spiritual mean what? I cannot see it. I cannot touch it. It is not tangible. I cannot read. I cannot go to some my neighbor's house and then up in their pantry or in a hardware store or in a drug store or whatever. These things are in the spiritual realm, assigned specifically for Kevin, for Tom, for Jerry, for Mary, for Peter. They are there waiting for you at a specific time to be released. It says, blessed be the Lord our God, blessed be the God and Father, sorry, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The word heavenly there speaks of the spiritual realm. So listen, the purpose of our opponent is to rob us of these spiritual, because the spiritual blessings, these are the, 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 the things that will be manifested physically in your life as the physical part of the blessing. So the car, the house, the wife, everything that God has ordained, because the, the, these things also mimic the likeness, sorry, the, 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 Curses mimic the likeness of blessing. Cause so someone could come in your life as a as a nice looking man and seem to be godly as well as a woman, and this is a curse that appear to be a blessing. You calling it God, but the truth is, it's a curse. You're being deceived, and the minute you attach yourself to that and marry them and forge a covenant, then you watch your life go in the opposite direction to where it should have been going to to come in alignment with the blessings that was already set out for you. So the scripture is telling us here, every human being, particularly that of the believer, God has already, as it relates to what their callings are, all right, he has already put in place the blessings for these people. And whatever those blessings is, for the most part, it would be in correlation as to what they're called to be, what they're called to do. And this is why I say to a lot of people when I counsel them, if you're called to preach or sing or whatever, don't let nobody say to you, why are you always preaching on this particular thing? Why are you always, they did not call you. They did not put the blessings in the place in place for you. They were not, not the ones who have mapped out your life. God did that. And to, to be discouraged and take their advice, you're taking the, vice, the advice of the devil because this is not God. God says, listen, I call you to this path. I've called you to teach on sorcery. I've called you to teach on witchcraft. I didn't call Pastor So and So. I didn't call TD Jakes to do it. I didn't call Creflo Dollar to do it. I call you, Kevin. So no matter what people say, they would say, "Oh, you talk too long about this." Tune them out. Continue because I've called you for a specific people, and I've allowed you to go through all of the hell you went through, so you will have a a concrete understanding coupled with the Word of God. So when you minister, you minister with passion, tenacity, you, 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 the feeling of what you're doing isn't superficial because you've been there. And to see other people in which you, where you used to be ignites your fire even more to help pull them out. Talking to somebody. I'm talking to somebody tonight. But it's feel good tonight, yeah? I love it. So the Bible says the, 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 the initial stage of your blessing is spiritual. And it says, he has already blessed us with all, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Verse 4 says, now how has he done this? He said he has done it according as he has chosen us. Meaning that all of the spiritual blessings that are for you, it is an alignment with what you are called to do. And again, this doesn't have a lot to do with my teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And it's going to knock down so much of the the traditional uh, assumptions of what the scripture says. When God has called you, 
God has already ordained a specific husband, a specific wife, a specific pathway. All of this is in the plan of God. Okay? And according to scripture, according to verse 4 here, he says, all of your spiritual blessing will be in alignment according, listen, according as he, which is God or Jesus, has chosen us in him. And when did he do this? Before the foundation of the world. Kevin, when you met Deidre, that didn't happen the day you met her. This was the blessing now manifesting in your life that was for you before the foundation of the world. And this is a, all this has to do with what I have called you to do. I'm not going to put somebody in your life, Kevin, where you got to be bickering and fighting with wasting time and causing you not to preach the gospel. You think I put you through all of that, give you all this wealth of knowledge, all this understanding, all this revelation, all this ability to counsel on the thing. You think I give you all of that to hook you up with a person who's going to make your life a living hell that you lose your entire desire to preach the word of God. That's not God. And that's why I'm going to say over and over, many people challenge the, 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 the marriage after divorce on their limited knowledge. But I'm telling you, and God has not released me to teach this, which I've been holding back for a while. When I release this teaching from scripture, and, and, and you're going to understand first hand, God did not, that's why in the book of second or first Corinthians, where it talks about marriage and so on, it, it's, there's a specific piece a phrase in it that says, he has called us all to peace, not misery. But we ain't talking about that today. I tell you, man, my, my whole desire is to just chop down tradition, chop down man-made gospel, chop down the superficial saints, chop down all of that garbage. And let's literally, let's go back to the scripture because all our lives, we was told this, all our lives, this was what was the order of the day. And now when we go back to read with spiritual understanding, come to find out that we was in bondage all these years. All these years. But anyway, that's a different story. So we see here, the spiritual blessing is the key. And this is what the spiritual rob is coming. This is the, the, the demonic forces in the spiritual realm. Kevin, they come behind you. Okay, Susan, they come, you, you think they're coming behind you. That's a part of their strategy to make you believe that they're coming behind you, but they ain't coming behind you. They're coming behind those blessings because the blessings is the power pack. It is the, the booster shots that each level of your life, God is going to release that blessing according to how he's chosen you in him. And when did he do this? Before the foundation of the world. Now, how do we be in alignment with these blessings so that they can flow freely in our lives? Because again, the gospel nowadays is in order for God to release the blessing in your life, you got to pay for it. You got to come with seed. You got to come blowing shofars, wearing scarf and skating and doing fool. But that's not what the scriptures are saying. Remember, we are not in a physical fight. We are in a spiritual, consistent, constant, ongoing fight. And if we do not know the spiritual rules, we will be victims and not victors. So, so far I have shown you, we are not to focus, 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, on the seen, but the unseen. Ephesians 6 and 12 give us the hierarchy of the spiritual orders that are fighting against us, but not specifically us, but the blessings as we would have seen in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 make it clear. Now, hold on now, you're saved, you're sanctified, you got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongue, some assault and tree and a half quarter twist, but that ain't sufficient. He says, now put on the whole arm of God, which is not a physical suit. It is a spiritual suit that we pray. That's how we put it on. We pray it on. Father, I pray the whole arm of God, my helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, my shield of faith, my sword, which is the living word of God, my belt of truth and my shoes, short with the preparation of the peace of the gospel. If you don't remember all I just said, Lord, I put on the whole arm of God. So all I'm giving you here are the spiritual weaponry, and the spiritual strategies, and the spiritual rules and laws that if we don't know this, then we succumb to, you know what? Let's take a shortcut. Let me pay this man the CD you're asking for, and then somehow God is going to dispel all, all of this stuff Kevin talking about, and just, hey, come, you give us $10, now you come and you can get this. That's not going to happen. So how do we line ourselves up? How do, is there a spiritual rule where we could be aligned 
to receive the blessings that are already in place. Yes. So again, let me go to another one of my favorite scriptures. Let's go to Deuteronomy, and we're going to see this very, very clearly. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is where we're going to find this, and we're going to start from verse 1. Okay, because we want to see how do we achieve or get these blessings. And then we're going to see how the, the spiritual robbers get to rob us of them. All right? So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken, these are rules now, hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments. These are very clear which I commanded thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high. That's going to be the first sign of what God is going to do before the blessings come as a result of following his rules, his laws, his principles, his ordinances, his commandments, his precept. He said, the first thing I'm going to do is promote you. That's the first thing. And promotion don't necessarily mean promotion as in you get promoted on your job. Promotion and elevation of your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. So now you know what you're dealing with spiritually. So he says, if you follow these rules, this is a protocol. Now he says, now if you follow, if you obey my law, not what somebody is telling you, not no shortcuts, not no none of that. If you obey my law, he says, the first thing I'm doing, I'm going to set you on high above all nations, right? Now watch this. And all these blessings shall come upon you. What blessings? The one that I've secured for you in heavenly places before the foundation of the world. So Kevin, let me see if I get this straight. Are you saying to me, that if I follow the laws of God, like you've been preaching from day one, you keep pounding, follow the laws, the rules, the principles, put your focus on what the Bible says, not what somebody is telling you about seed and foolishness. So Kevin, you telling me that if I follow the laws of God, would we just read in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1, where it says that God has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and he has done it in verse 4, according to how he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You're telling me, that those blessings are automatic in my life. If I follow the laws of God, what part of that you ain't getting? But Kevin, that ain't simple. That, that, that too simple. I thought we had to write these love letters to Jesus and, and put a special seed in the thing I'm in. And then we had to go buy a vial of oil. Okay, that may be so, but I showed you my scripture. Now you show me your scripture where you support that. Show it to me. I could, I could wait a couple of time. Show me the scripture that tells you if you buy this vial of oil, if you put this cooking oil, Crisco, on your head, and God is going to, like I say, dispel all of his blessings, sorry, all of his rules, and then he's going to say, hey, you know what? While Kevin and doing all the rules, you bought me some money. <laughs> Tom, I love you. How much you bought there? $2,000 seed. Tom, you don't have to ever obey my law. You don't ever never submit to me, but because you brought the seed, I'm going to make it happen for you. Think about it. That's not God. You will never, God don't operate that way. He don't. He said here, you're reading it. You, you saw it. He says, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments. Not give him seed, not give him oil, not give him shofar, not give him miracle cloth, scarf, miracle jockey, underwear, none of that. He says, Commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God, I'm going to set you on high. Then verse 2 says, and all these blessings shall do what? Come on thee. I didn't say run away from me. But why are the blessings coming? He says, because you are obeying my law. He says, all these blessings shall come upon thee, and then it's going to overtake thee. If thou, he's going to reiterate it again. If thou shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. He, you just said this in verse 1. But he's showing the, the mere fact that he's reiterating it is because how important it is and how easy it is to miss when others are telling you to do something else. He says in verse 2 of Deuteronomy chapter 28, And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. He goes on with the blessing again. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall thou be in the fruit of thy body. So all of these blessings are raining down on me, not haphazardly, not arbitrarily, 
they are coming because Kevin has positioned himself by following the laws, the rules, the principles, the ordinance, the precepts, the command, and the principles of God. He has positioned himself. God says, okay, good. Stay right there. I got it for you. And I come in. I'm going to bless you in the field. Bless you in your storehouse. Bless you in your body. I'm going to bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Oh, boy, I love this, yeah? L -l -l Listen to this. Verse 3. Bless shall thou be in the city. Bless shall thou be in the field. Bless shall thou be in the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thine kind and the flock of thy sheep blessed verse five shall be the basket in the storehouse six blessed shall thou be when thou comest in and when thou goest out verse seven the lord shall cause thine enemies all this is blessing now that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face they shall come out against thee one way and flee from thee in seven different ways i love voice eight the Lord shall command the blessings. Hold on, this is a more blessing? Yes, because you're lined up. How did I get lined up? You've been following my laws, my rules, my principles, my ordinance. You've, been, you've done what I've asked you to do. So because you have done what I've asked you to do, you don't have to sow no seed to me. You don't have to do all of these monetary stuff and all of this hocus pocus theatric nonsense. If you follow my law, the blessings are automatic. Talk to me, somebody. Talk to me. Talk to me tonight. Oh, Lord, I feel in this tonight. Mm -mm. You all hear this? The ble This right here, this right here should say, to, should, well, that's what it did for me. I can't believe all them years I was sowing. That's why nothing ever happened for you. And that's why whatever did happen was in trickle effect. Because you are not following the law. He says, if you obey, not some, but all my commandments. According to Ephesians 1 verse 3, he says, Blessed be the Lord our God who has already, Kevin, God has already blessed you, you know. Yeah, I know that, but how come I feel in the blessing yet? Because you're not following the laws, the rules, the principles. He says, if you follow this law, the blessings are going to come to you. Listen, let's drop to verse 12. Listen to verse 12. Verse 12 says, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. All it is he's doing because I'm following the law. But, but God, that ain't what the preachers don't tell me. They tell me I need to sow a seed. <laughs> he says, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the works of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow. All of this is because I'm following the laws, the rules, and the principles of God. Now, this is the part I wanted to get to tonight. Remember, we're just building a foundation. How is it that in my 6th, 7th, 10th year of Christianity, and all I've been hearing is, there's a shift, there's a new season. I hear God say, He's going to turn that thing around. God says he's going to do, do a blessing in your life that's going to blow your mind. I've been hearing this year after year. But all I could see in my life is losses. Divorce, can't get promoted on my job, uh, trouble on every side, but I'm a believer. But this is going contrary to all of these blessings. But no one never said to me, Kevin, the blessings are not automatic if you're not following the rules. In fact, Kevin, when you do anything that's contrary to that specific rule to invite the blessings, the reality is you are a co-conspirator with the kingdom of darkness. Because if you're going against the laws of God, then you're giving the kingdom of darkness the right to not only hijack your blessings, which are all spiritual, so that you would never see the physical manifestations of what they should have produced, it's now going to be replaced with curses. Now let's prove this. Let's drop to verse 15 of the same chapter. But, but, but it shall come to pass if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the, I am not following his rules, I am not following his principles. In fact, I'm going to do even something worse. I'm going to do what some other person is telling me to do, who claim to be a leader of Jesus Christ. And they're telling me, sow a seed, plant your seed in the ground right now, and God, watch that healing come to you. Watch your children come off drugs. Watch the promotion come. But wake up, Kevin. Where can we find this in Scripture? 
Because we're reading here, Kevin, according to spiritual law, this is not Kevin's opinion, according to spiritual law, it is very, very, very clear. He says, if I choose not to follow his law, and I did something even worse, I'm following the law and rules of a mere mortal. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and the statutes which I command thee this day, that, the, that these curses... These curses shall, so, so what is it saying here? Be, when I decide not to follow God, the blessings are suspended. And the curses now have the right to come into my life. Meaning that the enemy have the right to rob me of my spiritual blessings that was put aside for me. Hijack them. And say, I got this now. Yeah, Kevin, I got this right here. Now you have this, you have this curse. And I hold on to this blessing. Let me put this over here. I talking to somebody trying to help you tonight. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at the scriptures. I didn't write it. So this is what happens when you follow them and not him. He told you what to do. But he says here, if you make the decision, I'm not going to stop you. I gave you free will. I gave you free will. I God will never impose. Now church leaders do it. Not all of them. Most of them. Most of them bully you. Most of them threaten you. Threaten you. Most of them curse you. God will never do that. He said, I told you, if you take this route here, the blessings can come. I'm telling you, if you take this route here, the curses will come. I ain't putting no pressure on you. All I do is lay down my rules. Now, it's totally up to you. So he says, but it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and do what? Overtake thee. Now he began to say, curse shall thou be. What is happening? <clears throat> These curses that's raining down on you is where the blessing should have been. But the spiritual robbers come and hijack them from you. By talking to somebody tonight. I talking to somebody tonight. Now, I just wanted to lay that principle down for you. So, so far, what have we unearthed? What have we discovered? Well, we've discovered that A, we live in a world. Yes, it's physical, but we coexist with spiritual beings. And according to all that I have said, the kingdom of darkness as it relates to the blessings and the king, sorry, the kingdom of light as it relates to the blessings and the kingdom of darkness that relates to the curses, they are all activated and now will begin to manifest in our lives depending on which route we take. Very simple. If we follow it God way and do exactly what God tells us to do, then no joke call us, uh, uh, no jokey pastor, and I call them jokey meaning because they're going against God's laws, could ever bamboozle you because you're going to say in your spirit, no, 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 no. That's not what the Bible is saying. And I don't care how great of a pastor or a claim you are, your notoriety and personality does not override the laws of God. Very simple. So if we decide to take the route that is against the laws of God, our blessings are hijacked, and it's now replaced with curses. So, with that said, now I'm going to take you into the dream aspect of it. Now, remember, this is just a foundation we're doing tonight. We're going to be speaking on this just about the whole week. So, I'm going to take you now, and I'm going to show you how the spiritual robbers invade your life. But I'm going to tell you this right now. When they come, they come in. On, 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 the, on a point of order. And the point of order is, we got you now, Kevin. We got you. You didn't repent. You didn't do this. You, we got you. Remember, write the scripture down. Psalms 94 verse 20. And it says, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with us? No, it shouldn't. He says, however, but the throne of iniquity established their mischief, their manipulation, their evil, their attack against mankind. How do they do it? By laws. How do they do it? By they, if I could get Kevin to subscribe to Deuteronomy 15 going forward, then I got the right. God cannot stop me. That's these spiritual beings, the spiritual robbers. God cannot stop me. He, I have the right. If once Kevin, I need Kevin's cooperation. Kevin has to break the law. When he breaks that law, when he does not repent, Kevin have no idea that he's forging an agreement with the kingdom of darkness. Hence, the spiritual door of his life is open. And now the spiritual robbers are going to come in. Y'all come now. Y'all come and y'all rob him now. Now, how do we see this initially? Well, in the spiritual realm. What you mean, Kevin? Yes, and this is the beauty of it. You see, I said to you before in all of my teachings on dreams, 
You see, your dreams takes you into the spiritual world and it's giving you short clips or excerpts of what's pending for your life or against your life. The best analogy that I can give you, imagine me being in this house right now with no windows at all. I don't know what's happening outside. However, this house on the outside is loaded with cameras and all of those cords are coming right here to my monitor. And even though there are no windows outside, I can just click different monitors and see the activity outside, even though there are no windows here. It is the exact thing when it comes to your dreams. Your dreams are your spiritual monitors. And it's allowing you to see what has been conceived in the spiritual world pending for your life or against your life. This is where you see the spiritual robbers. And I'm going to give you two nuggets right now. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to relate to this, how you can tell the spiritual robbers in your life. How many of you have had this dream where you're always losing your car? Or you've had dreams where you lost your tooth or your teeth are dropping out or you lost your shoe. Or where your home is in reality, always in the dream, your home is never there. All of these are symbols of uh, uh, spiritual robbers robbing you in the spiritual realm. Why are you talking to some? Let me take my time tonight. <sighs> I can take my time tonight. I can take my time. Let me, because I got to give you up. You know, I can give you scripture. I give you your get your pen because I come. Everything that I say to you will be based on scripture. I have no opinions here. Pure scripture. Pure scripture you're going to get. Whenever you are having dreams and you're always losing or something is being taken away from you or stolen from you, this is clear evidence of the spiritual robbers and the things that are being stolen, stolen, these are representing your spiritual blessing. So once they take it from you spiritually, then clearly it cannot manifest physically. But the key thing is here isn't so much let's focus on what's being stolen from us. What is giving these forces or entities the right to rob us? Because according to the law, uh, Psalms 94 verse 20 to be exact, it says that these, the king, the throne of iniquity, forge their mischief by laws. So what law did I violate that gave this thing the right to rob me spiritually? Mm, boy, loving this. Okay, so watch this now. Let's go to let's go to Matthew 13 verse 25. Matthew 13 and verse 25. While you're doing that, let me just pull up something here. I have to block someone here because they're distracting my program. So I'm going to shut them down right here. I, the last thing I need is this spiritual robot up in here. <laughs> okay, so we, we, I ain't going to call in here because I know they want the attention. That's not going to happen. So let me just pull you up here, and I want to do you a little favor by getting rid of you. Okay, just give me one second here, folks. All right, here we go. Where are you now? Where are you? Okay, here we go. So give me one second, folks. Let me just uh, block this person who Satan uh, has hired, okay? <laughs> give me one second. Where are you? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, so I want to... Okay. Bingo right there. This user... Messages will be hidden. Beautiful. Okay, now let's get back to our regularly scheduled program. All right, beautiful. Okay, so like I was saying earlier, right? Just had to shut that poison down. <clears throat> like I was saying earlier, if you have had dreams, very common dreams, you've seen, you, you in a dream, you pulled up some, to a store, to a home, to someone's home in your car, but by the time you would have completed what you went to that person phone, you come up, the car is gone. Or you're trying to get dressed to go somewhere. You have one for the shoe, but the next one is gone. Or you're having these dreams where your, your teeth gone missing or, or falling out all the time. Why is this? Why, why are you having dreams where your, your clothes, your clothing is missing? Or you go to the shop to get something and, and they don't have the full set. All this is in the dream. And all of these are pointing to 
to, to spiritual robbers. But again, don't focus on the teeth going missing. Don't focus on the cargo. The focus is what do they symbolize? Yes, they symbolize spiritual robbers, but the key here is according to Psalms 94 verse 20, what gave the spiritual robber the right to come into your life, all right? So let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 25. We're gonna see a spiritual law wrapped up in a parable, okay? So Matthew chapter 13, verse 25, because we get to see these spiritual robbers for the most part, excuse me, in our dreams, okay? In our dreams. So in Matthew chapter 13, verse 25, listen what it says, Jesus speaking. He says, but, but while men slept, mm -hmm, his enemy came and sowed tears or planted curses among the wheat or planted curses among his blessings. And what did the enemy do? Now that the enemy has already done this in the spiritual realm via the dream, he now goes his way. Why? Because what the enemy has done is program this guy's life, because he has a legal right to do it. Clearly, if he's coming in to do these things, he's planting it there, and he goes his way. So he's sitting back. Let me see if Kevin is going to agree with this dream. Let me see if he's going to rebuke this when he gets up. Let me see if he's just going to go tell everybody, child, I had a dream last night, and my car just gone missing. He didn't cancel it. He didn't rebuke it. And all the spiritual robbers waiting on is that if Kevin don't challenge this, I have every right to run my course in his life. So the scripture is saying, which is a principle, he says, but while men slept, you see, because most people don't understand the spiritual realm. They don't know that when they're sleeping, while their physical body's at rest, their spirit, their soulish man is interacting in the spiritual world. The nightmares and the things coming after you in the dreams, these are not just little clips of movies. No, this, this, is, this, is, this is where you're going to after you die, to the spiritual realm. This is the real world. And how you interact in that world will determine how things will unfold in your life physically. Did you agree with this or did you disagree with it? So he says, while men slept, his enemy came and so tears him on Okay, Kevin, I get that. But why would the spirit or the, the spiritual robber, sorry, need permission from us? And I'm glad you asked because we're going to look at some more laws. And I'm sure those who follow me know this already. We go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Okay, let's go back to Genesis, and we're going to come right back here to Matthew 13. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, okay? And we're going to read verse 26 to verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them, which is mankind, let them have what? Dominion. Now, who's this them? Mankind. Who's mankind? This would be Adam and Eve. And who is Adam and Eve, and what are they when God addressed them as mankind? Spirit, soul, and more primarily body. This, this physical suit gives us the legal right to operate in this realm legally. Because the day we lose this suit, meaning we die, then we have to depart from this side and go into the spiritual realm. That's not an option for us. Because all death simply is, is an extraction of your spirit and soul from this physical shell. This goes back to the dirt, and the rest of you go into the spiritual realm. Now, why am I putting emphasis on this? Because the Bible says that he gave them dominion. Them would be mankind. What you didn't read there is he did not give spirits dominion. If they had dominion over the earth, like us, they would have never had to seek an agreement from us to do what they want to do. They have to have permission from mankind because he gave mankind dominion. If, if, you, if, you, if I gave you this house right now, you don't need permission from me to do what you want to do in here. I gave you permission. I gave you dominion when I surrender to you. Now, anyone who does not live in this house with you, or who authorized to be here, have to seek dominion from you to do what they want to do here. It's the same thing in Genesis. God gave mankind dominion. You will never see where he gave Satan, demons, angels. This is key because everybody's cha challenged this, but it's scripture. Neither did he give himself dominion over the earth. He created the earth, and this is what he did. He said, here now, Adam and Eve, you all have the key. This is your key now. And any spirit being that's going to want to operate here, now they can have and look on the earth, but if they want to engage in the things in the earth, they have to have your permission. So spirits, 
evil spirits understand this. So for the most part, because they know they will never get the permission, if they say, hey, Kevin, look here, I need your permission to afflict you with cancer. You think you can work that out for me? Well, they know that's not going to happen. So in my definition, if you would have read it on spiritual robbers, I say to you where the uh, spiritual robbers have to seek the agreement, which is called covenant, from their human victim, knowingly or unknowingly. And for the most part, it's unknowingly to the victim via Matthew 13, verse 25. He says, while men slept, this is the uh, slept, this sleep, this is the ideal time to manipulate the dreamer. Because to the dreamer, it's just a dream. But he don't know, she don't know that their interaction in the dream symbolically carries the weight of agreeing or disagreeing. And the spirit who is never looking for a casual relationship with the human beings because it's of no value, is looking to secure a covenant where they will have the free right to traffic in and out of the victim's life. I talking to somebody trying to help you. I trying to help you. If you don't just take write down the scriptures and go read it for yourself. Carefully, Jesus God said here at verse 26 of Genesis 1. And God said, Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image after our likeness, and let them who? Who's this them? Man. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every and over the cattle, and over all, and over all, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. All right? Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. Now watch this now, watch this now, watch this. And God blessed them. Here we go with the empowering thing again. This is the, this is the fuel to make man do what he couldn't do outside of the blessing. So what is a blessing really? The blessing is to empower you to do something that you could not do before. Let's prove it. So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, it says, and God blessed them. Why did you bless them? Huh? Why? Why didn't you just tell them be fruitful and multiply? No, because the prerequisite to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue, to replenish, will require the protocol of God endowing you with a spiritual blessing. So in verse 20, he says, and God bless them. Who's this them? Those who we gave the dominion to. And who was that? Mankind would have been inclusive of Adam and Eve. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful. Yeah, you could do it now because I've already blessed you. I've already empowered you. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue. Listen again, he's going to reiterate. In the next thing here and have dominion but you said this already over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air <clears throat> and over every living thing that moved upon the earth now this is powerful <clears throat> this is very powerful why is this powerful <sighs> when god blessed him in verse 28 of genesis 1 he empowered them to do four things but my challenge is with the fourth thing he said I'm blessing you, which will empower you to be fruitful. You will multiply, you will replenish. So to be fruitful means you will produce. To multiply means you'll increase more and more. To replenish, meaning now you're going to add to something that was already there. If the cup was half full, you're going to add some water to make it full. But then he said subdue, because to subdue means to something is opposing you and you must now restrain it and hold it down. So what is he saying? Every time I bless you, Kevin, there's going to be a force that's coming to try to rob you of it. That's all it means. Very simple. Hence the spiritual robbers. Why are you talking to someone today? So going back now, based on that piece of understanding, to Matthew 13, verse 25, he says, the enemy who you will not cooperate with under normal circumstances, if he comes to you with the spirit of infirmity and says, uh, listen, John, I really been trying to get liver cancer to operate in your life for a while now. And you know us being spiritual beings and having no right in the earth unless we get your agreement. I, I was wondering if you could work out where you could give me some leeway, you know, break some sins, don't repent. So we could squeeze this liver cancer thing on you. You know, I can please work with your brother. That will never happen. So how does the enemy manipulate? Well, let's attack them in the area they have very little knowledge of, which is the spiritual realm via their dreams. So Matthew 13, verse 25, is very, very clear. And it says that it says that while men slept, his enemy came and sowed these tears or 
curses among the wheat or among the blessing. I'm programming Kevin for failure through this dream because I'm seeking an agreement from him. Now I'm going to go over here. I'm going to leave now because I've already programmed him. All I'm waiting for him to do is cooperate with the programming. And really, I'm, 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 I'm because according to Psalms 94 verse 20, because this is how the enemy is thinking, spiritual being again, spiritual Robert to be more specific. He says, now, we've been trained by the kingdom of darkness that according to Psalms 94 verse 20, part B, it says we, we forge or conceive our mischief by laws. So the law says, according to Hosea 4 and 6, it says the people of God, like Kevin, they, are, they will perish or they will succumb to curses. How? Because they lack knowledge. So wouldn't it be, if Kevin is already unlearned in spiritual things, then it's very easy to manipulate him via his dreams. So what I'm going to do now, I am going to send his Grammy, whom he loves so much, who is deceased now, and I'm going to send a masquerading spirit, which is really a spiritual robber, to masquerade as his Grammy. But he's ignorant of the laws of necromancy, of having no affiliations with the dead, and that these people that appear to be his dead relatives are actually evil spirits of poverty, uh, spirit of infirmity, and so on. That's pretending or masquerading as his Grammy. Not knowing that when he hugged in the dream and talked to her and followed instructions, she say he's coming in agreement with the spirit of poverty, with the spirit of uh, infirmity that has the likeness or masquerading as his relative. He don't know the law that says, marvel not, for even Satan has the ability to transform himself as an angel of life. He don't understand the laws of masquerading. So we're going to manipulate and take advantage of him in the dream. And we're going to let him run about and tell people I dream, but Grammy last night, oh my Lord, I know Grammy in heaven. She didn't look so nice. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. The Bible says, according to Ecclesiastes verse 9, verses 4 to 6, it says, the living know that they shall die, but the dead knows nothing. When a person dies, their love, their hate, their bitterness, envy, all of that comes to a crushing end, and they have no more portion under the sun. Scripture. Not my opinion, not how I feel. It's got nothing to do with me. Scripture. So when you don't know the rules, it is easy for you to be manipulated by the master manipulator. And who is that? Satan. So you would have gone it so far. I'm about to end right here. I can give you the rest tomorrow. I need to leave you, you know, hang in a little bit. You would have seen so far that I've taken you from scripture to scripture, not to impress you, but to show you the rules that are governing these things. And when we lack the knowledge of the rules, we become victims. Very, very simple. We become victims because we lack knowledge. And if we take our time and go through these things, it will make perfect, perfect sense to us, right? So again with this, all right? The rest I can give you tomorrow. Now, the Bible says, when this spiritual robber comes into your life, right? First of all, he's been observing you. And what he's been observing, excuse me, is... One thing, hmm. okay, okay, I've been following the rules, I <clears throat> mean much we could do with him, now we saw where he messed up, he lied, he cussed somebody, oh yeah, he did it, but he repented, oh, but this dude don't stop repenting, okay, let's see, let's see if anything else in his life, let's see, let's see if he have any evil thoughts about other women with Deidre, let's see, let's see if he's holding bitterness in his heart for someone who did him something 500 years ago, Mm, let me see. Because the enemy is looking at the rules. Okay, God rule says, according to Psalm 66, verse 18, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. Now, we need God to not listen to Kevin. So let's see. Let's look at his life to see if he have any iniquity in his heart. Because when we go before God, we say, hold on, God, see a lawyer. What? Now, don't, I don't care much. You like Kevin. I don't care much. He's your favorite son. You said if he got iniquity in his heart, you will not hear him. So you need to shut your ears right now if from Kevin because the iniquity is in his heart. And you need to stop Kevin from prospering because he's hiding sin. Your word declares in, in Proverbs 28 verse 13 that if he hide his sin, he shall not prosper. He's hiding sin, Lord. So this is where the enemy now comes with the law. It says that the throne of iniquity established their mischief by laws. 
That's what I'm reading. Proverbs 94 verse 20b. That's what I'm reading. Listen, the more you know the scriptures, the laws, the, the greater empowered you are as a believer of Jesus Christ, the more confident you'll become. Okay? And nobody could run no game on you. You must know the rules. He said they established their mischief by law and they're waiting on you to doze off to go to sleep because this is where the greatest advantage is. The greatest advantage. Because if this person is already at a, at a disadvantage by not knowing the rules, and especially if they're going on stuff like so seed demonic ghost doctrines, then they're going to wake up and say, oh Lord, I, I see the enemy coming. So I go and go sow a seed right now. Sow a seed. And what is that going to do again? Show us the scripture because this enemy is operating by rules and laws. So now show me where you sow the seed, how it's going to counteract what this enemy is doing. I, I need to see the, I, I will believe you, but show me the law. Don't, don't tell me what pastor tell you or what prophet so-and-so tell you because that's rubbish. Show me where the law says that if, if God gave me a preview of I saw my, my children being killed in a car accident. Now show me the law says if I plant a seed in church that that accident is going to stop. Because I read, put on the whole arm of God, okay? I, 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 I read uh, if, if I obey his laws, his rules, and his commandments, then shall the blessing come upon me. He will command the blessing. I read all of that, but I have yet to find the scripture that says if I plant something monetarily in a pastor life, in a church, whatever, that that accident will not happen because that's not the rules. We need to know the rules. So I'm going to stop with you tonight because I said I'm not going to be long as one hour and 16 minutes. I, I'm going to leave you hanging. We're going to do this the whole week. Let me put it to you right now because we have a lot to cover. But I want you to go over this because each night I come back, I am building on the foundation. So this is the first level. This is the foundation. We're going, sorry, this is the foundation. We're going to the first level tomorrow. And then on our Wednesday, we go into the second level. Thursday, the, the, the third level. And Friday, we'll be at the fourth level. So we're building a four-story building. And each level will support the level that's going to be built on top of it. And everything is going to be riddled with scripture. So at the end of this entire exercise, you will be a master at this if you follow the laws, the rules, and the principles. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the shortest teaching ever by Kevin Elioy. I <laughs> thank you, Lord, for your awesome word that I'm always fascinated and enthusiastic about. And again, it's my desire that you will give the, the followers and listeners of what I'm saying that same enthusiasm and hunger that that nothing will be able to offend them if, if they focus on the laws of God and and the goodness and the grace of you. I so love your word that says in Psalms 119 verse 165, and it says that great peace, which is what I have, great peace have they, such as myself, that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I love that, and it is so true. And I pray that for these people that while they're worried about losing their job or being on furlough or where the next meal coming from, Father, like myself, let their focus be you. Not money, not resources. Because when their focus becomes you, the blessings, listen, the blessings are automatic. They don't have to tap dance for it. They don't have to sow a seed. They don't have to do none of that. And, and the greatest day of my life outside of becoming a Christian is when I came into the knowledge that the blessings of God are automatic when we do the will of God, which are the rules, the laws, the principles, the ordinance, and the precepts of God. They are automatic. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says that if we hearken and listen and observe to do all his commandments, he initially, he said, I'm going to promote you, set you on high. Then shall these blessings not only come upon you, but overtake you. Then he now begin to become specific. I will bless you in your body, bless you in the field, bless you in your storehouses. Your enemy will come in one way and have to scatter seven different ways. Verse 8 says, aside from all of those blessings, I will now command a blessing towards you. Drop down in verse 12, he said, I'm going to open up my treasures and pour it out. All of this he is doing automatically. I don't have to ask him for it. Why though? Because I am following his laws, rules, principles. Not the church policy, not what pastor, bishop, teacher think. It is what God says. 
Father, I thank you for that understanding. I thank you for what you have placed in me to give to your people tonight, showing them the spiritual background of what's pulling the strings to our physical world, revealing to them in, in no uncertain way the reality of the spiritual realm, the world that we cannot see, but through your apostle Paul, you said that we ought to make that world priority according to 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. Maybe we said we must not set our eyes on the things that are seen, but we must focus on the unseen world because that world is eternal. That's the eternal world, and that world is pulling the string. That is the parent world to this physical world. I thank you tonight because you've made it clear to us that no way in this world or in your word did you give authority to spirits. You gave it to us. That's why they're on our trail, because as long as they could get us to cooperate with them, now they could impose their will upon us. But now that we know better, we will do better. And that is, Father God, we want to inherit the blessings that you've already put in place for us. When did you do this? Before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I thank you, Father God, because you've also told us that even though we have Jesus Christ, even though we accepted your son, you said we must still put on the whole armor of God. Then you said in the next verse, verse 12 of Ephesians 6, you said because this is the, the order of invisible powers that is coming against us, principalities, uh, 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 powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual, spiritual, key word, invisible, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, things that we cannot see, sorcery and so on. So I thank you, Lord, as we are about to go through each night, there is another level of revelation that you're going to give us, empowering your people not to become victims anymore, not to be lazy Christians and just waiting to come across the next dollar to give to some preacher, believing that you're going to circumvent your rules, and because a certain point is not a certain amount of money, you are going to just let them go straight through, roll on the red carpet. I so thank you, Lord, because you're not like man. You, you are a God that cannot lie. If you said it, you'll do it. If you spoke it, you will make it good. You said, let every man be a liar, but let you, O oh God, be true. And I believe the word of God. I thank you tonight, Father God, because I have released what you have given me. And so looking forward to tomorrow night to give even more of your free, authentic word. Father, I cover everyone under the sound of my voice with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and the whole arm of God. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would do heart surgery tonight on those, spiritual heart surgery, of course, on those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that they will come to, to accept the free, the free gift of salvation, and that you will infuse them with an enthusiasm and hunger for the word of God. Your word declares, Father God, that they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be fulfilled, shall be satisfied. And I pray tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit, that the spirit of the living God that once descended on Adam and Eve and blessed them, that caused them to multiply, caused them to be fruitful, caused them to replenish and caused them to subdue. Father, let the blessings that you have put aside for them be snatched away from the kingdom of darkness where it was hijacked and be realigned back to their lives. Now catapult them to where they should have been at this point and at this stage of their lives in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we ask these things in the matchless and in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So, folks, that is it for me tonight. I cut that thing short because I could have run on all night. All I got is scripture for y'all. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to be back here with the mystery behind spiritual robbers part two. And we're going to go deeper in the word of God. Y'all see, you all see what happened to me. I told you on that fast that I was on. Listen. Listen, you see the revelation, right? So come back tomorrow night, bring a friend, tell them you got to come back on. And try to come on early tomorrow, probably around 8, 8.30, because we got a lot to cover. And, I, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you for free, okay? So God bless you. You have a marvelous night in Jesus' mighty name.